Can everybody hear me? Excellent. I know I'm the last thing keeping you from your weekend, so I'll try to make it short and sweet. Um, my name's Scott. Uh, I'm an ad targeting engineer at Yelp. I'm going to talk to you today about uh, optimal learning, some of the applications of it uh, that we found, and a tool that we recently open sourced called Mo to help tackle some of these problems. So first up, I'm going to tell you what optimal learning is, uh, why we should care about it, um, some applications, and then I'll introduce you to or uh, refresh your memory on the multi arm bandit problem, talk about why we care about that in the advertising industry, and uh, go into Bayesian global optimization and then this open source algorithm. I guess this doesn't work. Sweet. So what is optimal learning? Well, here we have my academic family tree, my advisor's advisor, my advisor, and me. You can think of it as collecting information when collecting that information is time consuming or expensive. So you want to do it as efficiently as possible. So you can imagine if you need to run an A-B test on live traffic, that's time consuming and expensive. Maybe you need to spin up a batch job that consumes 10,000 uh, cores on a cluster. It takes 24 hours and a bunch of money. Every time you run that, it's time consuming and expensive. So we want to be able to find the best sets of things to collect in as little, few iterations as possible. And in the advertising world, I think of this as making as much money as fast as possible. So, multi arm bandits. Here's the setup. You walk into a casino, and in front of you is K different slot machines. Now, each one has a different and unknown payout rate. I'm going to give you a fixed amount of time to try to make as much money as possible. So each one's set to free play, but you can still win the money. And the idea is you need to quickly get to the best slot machines in as few iterations as possible and start exploiting as quickly as possible. So how do you do that? We can think about this a little bit more mathematically. We have k different random variables. At any given time interval, I'm going to let you observe one of them and none of the others. And you get that one observation, and then you repeat. And we want to maximize our expected total reward. So given some number of times that I'm going to do this over and over again, I want to come up with a policy that gets me the highest number of rewards. So why do we care about problems like this? Well, it maps extremely well onto the click-through rate problem. You can think of each individual advertiser as a bandit or an arm, and we want to be able to maximize the number of clicks. We want to quickly be able to find the good advertisers in a situation and show those to the users and maximize how many clicks we observe. Or in an A-B testing framework, maybe initially I'm going to show half of you one version of Yelp, half of you another version of Yelp. Maybe after a short number of iterations, we're able to see that this is performing much worse than this. Maybe we can say with statistical certainty that it doesn't make sense to show 50-50 traffic anymore. We should start ramping down the allocations over here, maybe a quarter, maybe a fifth. Maybe we should just turn it off and show more and more over here. Using this information as we gather as we go, we can make sure we leave as little money on the table as possible. Fundamentally, this is a problem of exploration versus exploitation. We're gaining more knowledge about the system versus exploiting the knowledge that you already have. And with this, we can define regret. So regret is the difference between the best policy where we just walk into the casino, we know exactly which slot machine's the best, and we just go up to it and hit that one over and over again. This is also an impossible policy because we don't know that going in. But the difference between that and what we actually do is our regret. And you'll note that if we explore it all, we're going to have regret. And the best thing we can do is try to bound that in whatever scenario we have. So I'm going to talk about a naive policy to try to solve this, called the epsilon first policy. So the way this works is we're going to segment time into two different sections. An exploration only phase, where we're just going to sample randomly, or uniformly, or sequentially, whatever it is. And then an exploitation only phase. So whatever was the best after exploring, we're just going to hit that forever. And you can imagine this like a standard A-B test. I'm going to show you guys 50% of one version of my site, you guys a different version of my site. And then after two weeks, I'm going to turn it off. Whoever was the winner, we're just going to go with that for the next six years. So here's a toy example for this. Welcome to the Yelp Casino. We have three different slot machines. Each one has a different and unknown payout rate. I'm showing it to you guys, but the algorithm doesn't know this. At the beginning, you know nothing. So we're going to start sample. Yay, gambling's fun. OK, so now, after nine iterations, we've sampled each slot machine three times, and we see that the middle one here is 100% of the time. 
All right, perfect. Let's just hit that one. Exploit and profit forever, right? Well, in this particular situation, that actually works out because in our few samples, we've actually selected the best one here. And so we're actually gonna have very little regret. But this could have been the underlying system. Maybe we got really lucky with that middle one. And the one on the left there is actually the best. And we just got unlucky with one of the samples. So now all of a sudden, when we hit this middle one over and over again, we're gonna have a lot of regret. And depending on our situation, this might not be so bad. If I told you in your casino, you only had 10 things to run on, then sampling the wrong one for your 10th one isn't so bad. But if I told you you had a year to get as much money as possible, all of a sudden, this unbounded regret is gonna hurt us quite a bit. So the amount of exploration kinda needs to depend on the data that we're getting in. It needs to depend on the situation that we have. We basically need better policies. Thankfully, academia has been churning away at this for 60 plus years. Hundreds of thousands of academic man hours have been poured into this. There's many, many different papers, many, many different algorithms with different regret bounds that work in different situations. Which is great because the real world isn't as simple as this. In the real world, hardware constraints can limit your real time knowledge. In the original formulation of the problem, I told you you pulled an arm and you immediately saw whether you won or lost. But what if instead, I'm running to a log that goes to S3, I'm gonna run a batch over it, maybe 15 minutes later I know whether or not a user clicked on that ad or not. I wanna make sure that I'm not making suboptimal decisions in that lag time. I need to make sure that I can do this in a batch system. The payoff can be noisy or non-binary, can change in time. Maybe I don't care about clicks, maybe I care about revenue. Well now, when someone wins, uh, when someone gets a click, it's gone through a second price auction, I get some amount of revenue out of it, something like that, there's a dynamic system doing the auto bidding, all of a sudden it becomes a lot more convoluted. And we need to make sure we model that in, so if I'm trying to raise revenue, I'm not just looking for clicks. We can be sampling many independent experiments at once, or maybe they're not independent, and we need to take that into account. Arms can also expire. Um, speculation on who's gonna win the Super Bowl in a couple of months is probably getting a lot of clicks on new sites right now. But in a year or two, who wins this Super Bowl is gonna be old news. No one's wanna click, get, wanna click on that anymore. So we need some way to like forget data or let things expire. If you have knowledge about the user, maybe I'm more likely to click on football ads and someone else is more likely to cl click on basketball ads. Regressing to the global mean could lose some of that fine-grained information and end up lowering our overall uh, reward and increase our regret. The number of arms can also increase or become continuous. So if I'm selecting between some certain small finite number of things, it makes sense maybe to frame it in a multi-arm bandit context. But if I'm trying to select the best parameter or hyperparameter to put into my machine learning system, now all of a sudden I need to treat this as a, as a different problem. Basically, every problem is different. It's an active field of research, tons of papers published all the time. Um, we employ a lot of these different strategies within that Mo architecture I was talking about, um, and we're extending it all the time. But I'm gonna dive right into global optimization here, which is the meat of the talk. Um, so the goal of this is very similar to uh, a meat stock, um, where we're trying to uh, find the best uh, hyperparameters or parameters for some function um, in as few samples as possible. So we have some objective function, click-through rate, revenue, um, log loss, whatever it may be. We have some parameters of our system. These can be config values, thresholds, cutoffs, hyperparameters to your models, whatever it is. We imagine the, the whole system as just a function that wraps these parameters and spits out this value we want, this overall evaluation criterion. Uh, maybe it's churn, whatever. So we want to sample this underlying function as few times as possible, because maybe every time we sample it, it's super expensive. We need to run a two-week A-B test, or we need to run on 100,000 cores, whatever it is. For the rest of the talk, um, there's going to be a little bit of math at the bottom. For the sake of the large audience, I'm just going to completely gloss over it. Half of you probably can't see it anyway. Come talk to me afterwards, and I'm happy to go over whatever or uh, give you references. So to solve problems like this, we built Mo, the metric optimization engine. I'm gonna hit this at various uh, uh, levels here. This is the 10,000 foot view. We take the history of how past parameters are performed, put it into Mo, does some fancy math, new optimal parameters come out. One level deeper, it optimizes some metrics, some overall uh, uh, objective function that we wanna have go up or down. It takes the past parameters, tells you what to sample next, you sample that, it updates its view of the world, you tell it, you ask it what to sample next, 
and you do this, and you repeat this as a loop as you converge into these optimal parameters. Here's a real world example. So on Yelp, we show two different types of advertisements sometimes. We'll either show you um, a review uh, ad that has three lines of review text from uh, another user, or two lines of review text and some distance information. And you can imagine different situations where one might be more helpful th than the other. If I'm on my mobile phone looking for pizza at midnight, I want it to be close and I want them to serve pizza, and I don't care m about much else. But if I'm on my desktop looking for a plumber, maybe I care more about the contextual information, someone else's experience. Having 50% more review text may make me trust this more and we'd be more willing to click on this ad. And so you can imagine for different devices, different categories, different features, there's different thresholds for when I'm going to show this distance information or not. And being able to learn this as quickly as possible is very important. And so what we basically did is we had a lot of implicit thresholds we had in our system before, where the engineer just sat down and was like, I think it should be 20 here and 15 here, whatever it is. Uh, maybe you run a really local grid search or something like that over an A-B test, then you set it and forget it. It sits in your constants file for years. Um, we fed those into Mo. The objective was click-through rate in this case. It told us what to sample next. We ran an A-B test, sampled that. And over a few number of iterations, we were able to converge into these optimal thresholds across all of these different devices and categories that lifted the click-through rate throughout the system. So why do we need Mo? And once again, this was alluded to earlier. Um, hyperparameter optimization is a very difficult problem. In practice, a lot of people just do grid search or random search. Uh, these can be exponential in the number of dimensions. Some people just ignore the problem. Um, it can be intractable to sit down and reason about how these work in every individual situation. If you have a thousand different categories or a bunch of different device types or whatever it is, um, spending time thinking about each one doesn't work with engineering bandwidth. Um, your, heur your heuristics can quickly uh, break in the real world. If you're assuming it's convex or that it's linear or that two things don't interact with each other, a lot of times that doesn't actually work. Um, Mo tries to tackle these problems from the ground up uh, in an optimal way. So, how does it actually work? Um, there's four main steps. I'm going to dive into each one of these in a little bit more detail later. But uh, at the high level, we build a Gaussian process uh, given the points sampled so far. So this is our model of the world. So basically, we've sampled whatever, and we want to come up with some way to represent that underlying function. And we've chosen a Gaussian process to represent that. Then we want to find the best Gaussian process. So we have to do hyperparameter optimization on this Gaussian process. Thankfully, that's analytic, and we can do that very quickly using standard techniques. We don't have to treat that like a black box. So we've chosen a Gaussian process. Now we want to find the best possible Gaussian process. We find that. And then we want to find the points of best expected improvement. Given this model of the world, we want to find the points that, get, that we expect to beat the best point we've seen so far by the most. So we're playing king of the hill. I saw this, it was pretty good. I want to beat it by this much more. Or give me a set of points because I can run four concurrent experiments. Um, we return this to the user, they sample it. We update our model of the world and continue on as we converge into these optimal points. So what's a Gaussian process? There's two ways to think of this. One is uh, at every point in the space, we're representing that underlying function with a Gaussian. There's some mean and there's some variance. At the beginning, we don't know anything, so we just take the prior. But as we start to sample points, our view of the world starts to change. You see the mean drops and the variance gets uh, tighter around points that we've sampled. So we have a little bit more knowledge. It's not going to be as random around those points. The mean should drop down to it. Um, our underlying function becomes more and more uh, known as we sample more and more points. And we can use this to exploit and find the points of highest expected improvement. Um, the other way to think of Gaussian processes is from the functional perspective. So at the beginning, you have some bag of functions. And any of these functions could represent that underlying thing we care about. There are click-through rate with respect to all of our thresholds. Um, as we start to sample points, some of these functions make less and less sense. If we're sampling with no noise, then any function that doesn't pass through a point we've observed, we can just immediately throw out because it doesn't make sense in our world. And as we start to throw these functions out, other functions become more probable. 
So the function that passes through all of our points and does it in kind of a smooth way, that's the most likely function. And that's the mean of our Gaussian process. And it kind of fans away from that for these slightly less likely functions. And so we're drawing from that when we're sampling from the Gaussian process, this bag of functions. Now, every individual point has to be able to influence another point in the space, otherwise optimization is impossible. If I sample over here, it should have some effect on sampling something over here. And we can come up with how these things covary with each other. And this is where the hyperparameters of the Gaussian process come in. You have a covariance matrix, um, and there's an underlying covariance kernel, and there's things like length scales there. Like, when I'm trying to vary that uh, threshold for when I should show distance on my ads, I would expect the length scale to maybe be on the order of miles. Something on the order of inches doesn't make as much sense. Light years doesn't make a lot of sense. I expect that to vary around miles. And so what we can do with the Gaussian process is say, given the, lengths, given the data that I've observed so far, what hyperparameters make the most sense? We can completely overfit our problem, which is there on the left. The variance is a little hard to see in this projector. We can underfit our problem, where we just kind of smoothly cut through everything, or we can find something that's just right, which is the one here on the right. And basically, we can find the set of hyperparameters that are most likely given the data we've observed so far. So now we have a Gaussian process, a way to represent that underlying function, and we have the best hyperparameters for it. So now we have the best Gaussian process. And now we can do optimization here because we've taken it from this really hard to sample two weeks for every data point space, and now we have this smooth, nice analytic Gaussian process space. We want to find the points of highest expected improvement. Once again, these are the points that we expect to beat the best point we've seen so far by the most. And so originally, we have no information, one-dimensional problem here. We start to sample. In this case, we're going to minimize. So imagine this as churn or loss or whatever it is. Um, and so on the, we sample over on the right. It updates our Gaussian process. Our expected improvement down, down there at the bottom is pretty low. We don't want to sample the same point again. It didn't do so well. We also have really low variance there because we just sampled there. Um, so it tells us to sample way over on the left. We do that. Now all of a sudden it gets this information and it says, OK, in the middle here, relatively low mean, high variance. Maybe there's some good stuff here. It's kind of trading off that exploration and exploitation. We sample there. And we can continue doing this over and over again as we converge to some global minimum here in the middle. And we can have our stopping criteria be, I don't expect to beat this point by more than 1%, or it's varying in whatever dimensionality I have by some small amount, whatever it is you care about. Or you can continue to sample and let it drift over time. Because in reality, a lot of these systems change. And uh, you're not just climbing a mountain, you're surfing a wave. But as we sample over and over, we eventually get to these points, and you can get the best thing to sample next. So how does this actually work? How do we use this? Um, well, like many of you, we have an app, and we have users. And we love to run experiments over these users. And so uh, the, ways that we, the way that we do this is we can allocate, allocate users into buckets. So you're one cohort. You're seeing a blue version of Yelp for today. You're another cohort. You're seeing a red version of Yelp. Um, so cohort, uh, users are mapped to cohorts. Cohorts are mapped to parameters, blue, red, or distance threshold 20, distance threshold 15. Um, then we run this for a day or an hour or whatever it is. We run a batch over our data, and we collect what we care about, that click-through rate, that revenue, whatever it is. Um, and then traditionally, what would happen next is you'd sit down and you'd look at it and you'd say, oh, 15 didn't do so well, 20 did pretty well. Maybe I'll try 25 next, or I'll try 18 next, or something like that. Um, instead of doing that grid search or that random search, you can feed it into Mo. And it can tell you with the multi-arm bandits how to change the traffic allocations. 15 didn't do so well, but we're not perfectly sure. Maybe instead of 50-50, we should ramp this down to 20%. You guys get 60%. Maybe we have this now 20% to play with. Let's try 10%, 18, 10%, 25, whatever it is. And then we can continue to do this over and over as you're playing king of the hill. 25 does good. We start ramping that up. We kill this off. And it's kind of always playing this game of trading off, leaving as little money on the table as possible while you're converging to these optimal parameters. Another way to do this that might be more applicable to this crowd is uh, expensive batch systems. So everybody's got big data. 
Everybody's got some machine learning framework. This can be running on Spark, it can be running on whatever it is, some complex regression, deep learning, whatever it may be. Every single one of these things has hyperparameters. At some level, there's a hyperparameters going on in there. Um, and basically what happens now is you try one set of hyperparameters, you test, see what metrics you care about, you want them to go up or down, then you try another set, maybe you're doing random search, maybe you're doing grid search, maybe you're doing something greedy. Um, you can feed this into Mo, and it can say, okay, given the data that we've observed so far, we think we should sample this one next. Um, and then you can continue to do this as, and the, the main thing about Mo is it's treating every function evaluation as precious. So if you can perform 10,000 different things at once, then you can do like annealing, or you can get derivative information, or you can do whatever it is, there may be a faster way to get there. But if every single function evaluation is precious, every time you need to run that overnight batch job, Mo will trade that off and make sure that you're always getting whatever it expects to improve the best thing you've seen so far by the most. So, it sounds like magic. Does it actually work? Well, it's live in production at Yelp. It's informing active experiments. It's successfully optimizing towards all the metrics that we've given it. And this is something you actually have to be a little bit careful uh, with, and Xavier alluded to it earlier. If you just tell it to optimize something, like I want to minimize log loss, then it, and you don't tell it anything about your regularization or what your model is or something like that, it could potentially overfit your model. What you need to do is come up with this overall uh, evaluation crit criterion that is everything you actually care about. Build that objective function to say, if this goes up, that means better. So maybe pull in some of these other things. Another classic example is, if I'm just trying to optimize revenue and I feed the whole system into this, then maybe it could say, well, if you show worse search results, then relatively the ad gets better. More people click on ads, revenue goes up. It's a win. So you need to make sure that you have your objective actually take into account everything you care about. Revenue plus user retention plus engagement, whatever it is. And then you can turn it on to this. And the great thing about this is it treats it like a black box. You can apply it to anything. The bad thing about this is it treats it like a black box. You have to be careful what you turn it on to. Uh, Mo's open source. We released it about two months ago. Uh, you can download it right now on uh, GitHub. Uh, we tried to tackle this problem from a very like, hardcore software engineering approach. So uh, the original code was very academic. Um, stretching back to my thesis, we tried to hit it from the very beginning, very well tested, very well documented, very easy to use and install. It has the multi-armed bandits in it, global optimization. Um, there's a REST API, so you can just s put it somewhere in your system and you don't even really have to worry about it. Um, you can also hit the Python if you want to. A lot of the math is a lot faster in C++ or CUDA. GPU is not required, but if you have it, it can make it go a lot faster, very trivially parallelizable at many different levels. Um, you can dig into it at any level, should be well documented throughout. Um, it can also be run and spun up in a Docker container. Um, I don't know how many of you use Docker, but it's a great lightweight virtualization container system. Um, you can run it on any operating system and spin up little containers, little VMs effectively of different uh, uh, code bases. Mo can run on this, two minutes, two lines of code. You can have the REST API running. Um, spin up our little live demo that I showed earlier that was just D3 plotting out things. You can get some intuition on how Gaussian processes work. Try to break it. If you do, email me. No one's done it yet. Um, the demo, at least. <laughs> um, so, yeah. With that, uh, I guess there's probably no time for questions. I'm uh, running short on time already. Um, but shoot me an email or tweet at me. I just tweeted these slides. There's some references at the end and some use, other use cases. Um, download it, give it a try, tell me if you like it, let me know if it breaks. Thanks.